Content warning. This video takes a mostly fun, celebratory tone, but it does discuss implied transphobia, violence, and child abuse. I'll be providing specific time codes for some of the heavier stuff as we go. For reasons that are too boring to get into, I found myself describing the plot of Drew Barrymore's 2009 directorial debut, Whip It, a film in which Elliot Page does roller derby, and it's cool as shit. Because I was referring to Page's character Bliss with they, them pronouns, I ended up realizing that, oh, holy shit, this is a, this is a pretty good trans allegory. So that's all this video is gonna be. Elliot Page movies that, in hindsight, ended up being pretty good trans allegories. First, some admin stuff. I'm non-binary. I came out about six years ago and I put my pronouns in every bio, so most people either know that already or figure it out pretty quickly. The specifics of my gender feelings aren't something I want to go into too much detail on right now. Maybe I'll talk about them more one day, but for now I'll say that I use the label non-binary because it most succinctly sums up my experience of gender, and because most forms don't give you space to write sludge boy scooped from the gender swamp and unsuccessfully taught to skateboard. Anyway, as you can imagine, I had a lot of feelings about Elliot Page's coming out and then again reading his interview in Time. Elliot Page uses he, him, and they, them pronouns, so I'll be using those pretty much interchangeably whether I'm talking about the character or the actor. I'll be using the names the characters are given because I don't really have an alternative there. Plus, like, all the characters' names could be boy names as well. And I guess every name is a unisex name if you believe in yourself. Also, when I say that something works as a trans allegory, what I mean is that the lens of this character is definitely trans is just one of the ways a film could be viewed, whether or not that was the intention of the filmmaker. As an example, The Matrix would still work as a trans allegory if the Wachowski sisters hadn't made it explicit. It seems that you've been living two lives. One of these lives has a future. Ah, there she is. <laughs> I also don't think these were necessarily on purpose. I don't think Elliot Page was beaming trans rays directly into my brain. Rather, the examples I'm using here are all the kind of things that make sense in hindsight. Of course, you don't have to agree with me, but whether you do or don't, I hope you'll hear me out. Anyway, this won't surprise you because I already said it in the introduction, but my first example is Whip It. In the hours before the plot of Whip It starts, Bliss is overcome by a fit of inspiration and dyed their hair blue. That fit of inspiration is followed immediately by a moment of, ah, oh, shit, my mom's gonna kill me. <laughs> Bliss's mother, Brooke, has a very specific and rigid notion of what is an acceptable gender performance, and the absolute bane of her existence is that her child keeps drifting out of that. What was that little stunt all about? You trying to sabotage your chances? Or was it just your biological urge to make your mother look like a jackass? Bliss has to sneak around to be their true self. The first time they feel truly comfortable is when they find a community of similar people. Incidentally, from what I know about Roll Derby, Real Derby is a lot gayer than it's presented in Whip It, and that doesn't really affect my reading of the film, uh, this just feels like a good time to bring that up. The conflict between Bliss and Brooke is resolved when Brooke pulls her head out of her ass and sees Bliss on their own terms. Brooke has to realize that her inflexibility was pushing her child away, and that when someone's gender expression is different to how you think it should be, the correct response is to be chill about it and support them however you can. So, uh... <laughs> I, I'm backing myself into a bit of a weird discourse corner with this one. Uh, if you know anything about the movie Hard Candy, you can probably guess why. Uh, for those who don't know, it's a movie where Elliot Page's character entraps a pedophile to and torture a confession out of him over the disappearance of a teenage girl. And when I first thought up this video topic, my mind immediately went to this movie, but I also thought that um, <laughs> maybe this is a weird choice. This movie just seems so perfect to me, but it is a movie about a violent person who misrepresents themselves in order to get close to their target. There's a whole Lindsay Ellis about how why that is perhaps less than ideal for a movie that I'm reading as a trans allegory, uh, but I, I just keep coming back to it and I have so much I want to say about it, so much more than I'm even putting here. Um, and I just, I feel like I have to talk about it. <laughs> I also don't think this falls under the usual trans murderer representation, because the usual way that goes is that the trans character's murderous nature is a direct result of their transness, but cis murderers uh, get to have their bloodthirsty nature be just one facet of their personality. So the solution here is that we just need more trans representation, and then we can have a trans murderer in a movie, and it's totally fine. God, what a weird thing to say. <laughs> Uh, I guess here is where I should say that in general I think murder is bad, and you may quote me on that. And to be clear, my analysis of Hard Candy mainly focuses on the conversations between the two characters, not necessarily their, um, 
many crimes. I watch a lot of revenge movies and this is one of those rare ones that is both very uncomfortable and weirdly cathartic at the same time. Um, but still, if you'd rather just skip the whole thing, here's the time code for the next bit. The protagonist of Hard Candy is on a mission to avenge the death of a missing girl, and their investigation has led them to Jeff. Jeff is charming, witty, successful, the kind of guy who's used to leading the conversation. Nobody suspects Jeff of anything because he is very careful about what he presents to the world, and he is always in control. In order to get close to Jeff, Haley transforms himself into the perfect underage girlfriend. He's smart, but he lacks confidence, he likes all the right things, and he's just the perfect age. <laughs> Ew. The whole first act of this film is honestly, like, terrifying, because you're watching a 30-something man groom a 14-year-old, and it plays out exactly as Jeff thinks it will, and you're just like, oh god, oh, Haley, Haley, get out of there, oh, Haley. But then surprise, Haley's been in control the whole time, and the rest of this movie's gonna be uncomfortable for a different reason. As I said before, Jeff is used to being in control. As a photographer, he is used to seeing and being seen in a specific way. He's used to controlling whoever he has in front of his camera. He first starts to get angry at Haley, not when he wakes up tied to a chair, but when he's photographing Haley and Haley leaves the studio. Jeff doesn't like Haley setting the terms, being in control. Doesn't like Haley doing something he doesn't want them doing. This is the first time Haley has ignored a direct instruction from him, and he is not into it. Later, he tries to psychoanalyze Haley, be the father figure he assumes they need. Jeff assumes that the way Haley acts is the result of something missing, a cry for attention, a need to feel special. I was at it. What, they're too busy to keep track of you? So you reach out to somebody who seems like he might care about you? And you're so mad because they ignore you? But you are angry. You gotta let it out somehow. So you find a guy, an older guy, maybe reminds you a little of your dad, and I seem like a good target. Will you I get shut it. up? I... Seriously, just shut up. You know nothing about me. No, you're right. So sit down and tell me. We'll talk. Yeah, right. No, we can sit on the sofa, and I'll, I'll call a taxi for you. If you want, I'll hold you. If you don't want, I'll keep my distance. You can let it all out if you need to cry, if you need to scream, whatever you need, Haley. He thinks Haley is acting out because of a sad childhood or absent parents. Of course, none of this has anything to do with Haley's well-being. He just thinks that if he can cure Haley's pathology, they'll go back to being that sweet girl he used to know, back to being something he understands, someone he can manipulate and groom. Now, I assume that nobody in my audience has ever kidnapped and tortured anyone before, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who finds this conversation weirdly relatable. You know how you have those people in your life who make it their mission to control you for apparently no reason other than that they can't? I used to have people in my life who acted like I was a project to them. Every time I stepped outside the box they put me in, they did everything they could to reel me back in or just to make me feel like shit for being myself. I had friends who acted like everything I did must be a reaction to trauma. Like, I had someone armchair diagnose me with whatever personality disorder she'd just learned about and decided was the worst thing in the world, like, in the middle of a conversation, because I asked her to back off. I'm sure that to her, every step I took towards being who I am looked like I was becoming a monster. Like, everything she could do to reel me back in was for the good of humanity. Like, everything she did that hurt me was a way to fix me. And just to be clear, I had just cut this person out of my life. I didn't go full Haley on her. Seriously, I kind of love this movie. Like, uh, obvious huge trigger warnings for child abuse and violence, but I do really recommend it. Okay, I'm gonna do a lightning round before I go into the last section. I'm gonna scroll through Elliot Page's movies on Letterboxd uh, and just see how I go, see what I, see what I do. Uh, let's see. Uh, the the X-Men's, the X-Men's that he was in, uh, that's pretty obvious. Everyone's, it's all, it's all gay. Everything, it's, it's super, super gay. The gayest of, yep. Apparently the director of that was a piece of shit though. <laughs> uh, Inception. Uh, you know, I actually remember his character being pretty well written and normally Christopher Nolan can't write female characters. So I guess that means Elliot Page has been a man this whole time. Christ, that's a bad one. Ooh. Ooh. 
uh, flatliners, flatliners, flatliners. Uh, just like transphobia, this was bad in the 90s and was a bad idea when it was remade. <laughs> is Flatliners a remake of a movie from the 90s I, or am I just making that up someone describe Flatliners to me I actually don't even know if it's good or bad oh wow I'm getting to oh Tiny Detectives what? Tiny Detectives Tiny, the Tiny Detectives oh god I'm getting into some weird ones it, I've organised the page by like highest to lowest rated and now I'm getting into like I downloaded a ghost <laughs> ghost cats <laughs> oh god holy shit I'm gonna watch these movies I'm gonna watch them and you know what maybe that's a future video it's gonna be all about I downloaded a ghost the movie from 2003 all right, this lightning round was a bad idea. I'm going to go back to the script. The Umbrella Academy is... Fuck, <laughs> I can't stop laughing. Fucking I downloaded a ghost. <laughs> I'm going to download you. Woo! <laughs> Beep boop. I'm a cyber ghost. <laughs> oh, Jesus. My computer's possessed by a cyber ghost. <laughs> All right, I can I can do scripts again. <clears throat> the Umbrella Academy is the comic that got me into comics. It's the comic that made me want to be a comic writer. And to be fair, I'm not, but who knows what the future holds. This comic, this one right here in my hands that I bought when I was 15 and the guy at the comic shop thought I wouldn't notice him rolling his eyes at me because he thought I was just a My Chemical Romance fangirl buying the comic that Gerard Way made. And at the time that was true, but also like, hey bud, Hey pal, hey mate, that attitude right there is what turns people away from comics. I say this as someone with a deep and abiding love of the art form, as someone who will leap to the defense of comics at minimal provocation and tremendous risk to my own personal dignity. Comics are bullshit. They are ridiculous and nonsense and that's what makes them wonderful. The thing that makes comics great is also the thing that makes them terrible, and that's that you can do whatever the fuck you want. And just because you've staked your identity on a different kind of weird, terrible bullshit doesn't give you the right to roll your eyes at me for my weird, terrible bullshit. Get off your high horse and sell me this weird, sad comic about childhood trauma. God, what was I talking about? I was so excited for the Netflix series, but I also was really nervous because, like, I needed it to be good. And it was a huge relief when it turned out to be, like, really, really good. <laughs> like, a lot has been changed from the comic, and most of those changes I appreciate, and I think it's really improved on the source material. Um, but there is one thing I really wish they'd kept, and it's the weird detail that Klaus can only use his powers when he's not wearing shoes. So when Hazel and Sha Sha kidnap him, they force him into the most hideous shoes they can find, and, like, <laughs> Like, baby, that's gold! Vanya is the odd one out, the only child of a super-powered family who is ordinary. At the start of the series, he's nursing resentment at his siblings for his exclusion as a child, and they're all nursing resentment towards him for airing out the family's dirty laundry in book form. Vanya starts to find happiness through Leonard, but Leonard only wants Vanya to be what he thinks Vanya is. Leonard is controlling and manipulative, and he literally has the handbook on how to abuse Vanya written by their first abuser. The season one twist, oh sorry, spoilers. The season one twist is that Vanya actually isn't ordinary. They might be the most extraordinary of them all. Except maybe the one who can open a portal to a hell dimension in his chest, but like, whatever. But while everyone else has a power that Hargreaves can control, can contain, can put a lid on, Vanya is threatening because they're someone Reginald can't control. Everything tiny Vanya does is about pushing back against their containment by their adoptive father. So he drugs them, pathologizes them, convinces Vanya that they're sick and they need to be changed from the inside out. Fucking Hargreaves, you piece of shit! This kid's whole life is everyone around him telling him that he's diseased, that he's wrong, that the thing inside him that makes him who he is needs to be destroyed. Vanya is tranquilized and gaslit, wandering through life as a shadow of himself, believing that he has nothing to offer because why wouldn't he? 
Eventually, he lashes out and hurts someone he cares about. Scared of what he can do, he turns back to his family only for Luther to recreate the abuse of their childhood. This backfires and Vanya becomes so completely himself, but it's a version guided by rage. His whole identity is vengeance against everyone who ever stood in their way. Also, this outfit is incredible. Apparently Elliot Page had a lot of creative control over it because he wasn't comfortable with the version of the white violin in the comic, and like, like yeah. This costume has what I like to call the mystique problem, and that's when a costume looks great in an illustration, but on screen it's a naked lady covered in paint. God, I gotta stop getting sidetracked. When season two starts, Vanya has no memory. It's an extreme reset, but it allows him to relearn who he is without the trauma. And what he learns is that he is capable of loving someone and being loved in return. When his family try to find him, it's because they want to contain him. Five has information that the world is going to end, and everyone immediately assumes it's Vanya's fault, because like, I mean, he did last time, so why not? When Vanya goes back to the farm to protect the woman they love, and her son, and I guess her husband as well, he does it knowing that his siblings won't back him up. Finally, the rest of the Hargreave siblings are forced to realise that it's never been them against Vanya, it's been all of them against the world. At the end, when he goes back to his family, it's without the hurt, it's without the hatred, and everyone understands each other and accepts each other and loves each other, and they're ready to go into the future together, and then fucking Hargreaves, you piece of shit! Anyway, the comment word is platypus. If you don't include it in your comment, I know you didn't watch all the way to the end before commenting. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Uh, this uh, this isn't the video I planned to put out this month, but I had a lot of emotions and I wanted to get them out there. Um, if you like what I do, you can support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Uh, also, I really do want to hear your opinions, so comment with an Elliot Page movie that you think makes a good trans allegory, or even just an okay trans allegory, or tell me what the plot of Flatliners is. Um, tell me what happens in it. Don't even don't even introduce it. Just just. Don't and don't copy paste it. I want to see. I want to see what your your summary of the Flatliners movie on this and every single one of my videos. Pick some of my videos, go to them. If you watch them, cool. But mainly, what I want you to do: go to any of my videos <laughs> and describe the plot of Flatliners in the comments section. Just render render my comments in unintelligible. Rem just do it. <laughs> just destroy my comments for normally for for different. To, to normal reasons. Um, you can also support me on Patreon if that's the kind of thing you're into. Uh, I currently only have one supporter on Patreon and she's pledged at the level where I put your name in the credits in a big font, so currently this is what my credits look like. Uh, and I'm torn because I do want more people to back my stuff, but I also like that my credits are really funny, <laughs> like this. Um, yeah. Also, if, if you like comics and Warhammer and crafting stuff, you should check out Morrigan's Instagram. She does she does cool stuff there. Uh, cool. That's it from me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Um, say hi to your pets for me.